menopause is such um, a buzzword and it's almost, well, I feel anyway, it's almost like fashionable now, whereas when I was banging on about it a few years ago, it certainly wasn't. How do you think businesses um, build supporting women going through menopause into their DNA? What can organisations here learn? Yeah, I mean, I, do you know, I think it's like most other inclusion agendas, which is get allies, Lee, round of applause, thank you. Um, educate, so Saskia, your business, absolutely fantastic. And then you just got to break the taboo. So I, I know you say it's fashionable and, and talking about it. I mean, I went to an event a few years ago on menopause. We were talking about the fact that people are so uncomfortable with the word and the connotation because it's about age, it's about bleeding, it's about not bleeding, it's only about women, um, that they said you have to say menopause 10 times a day in order to get comfortable with it, um, especially men in the room. You so, dropped the M-bomb. <laughs> yes. So 10 times a day, just repeat to myself, menopause, menopause, menopause. Um, we've, we've just got to get comfortable with it and say that support matters and that people can talk about it and create safe spaces for colleagues to, to um, share their experiences and help each other. So I suppose maybe this is a good time, um, a good time for a poll. Um, so um, if, uh, if, if I dare, if you're going through perimenopause or menopause at the moment, would you feel comfortable to talk to your boss about it? So uh, if you can answer that for us, yes or no. And we're gonna, we're gonna do two polls here as well. So that's sort of, um, you know, if you're going through those. <laughs> you can answer it if you want, fellas. <laughs> um, okay, so, I mean, reasonably split there. I mean, look, you know, and, and maybe that's because of the, you know, maybe our audience in, in the room. Um, and then the second thing, um, I'll just give that for a second. Right, okay. So I would say pretty split. Um, I would say I was probably more thinking it would be um, more on the more, more urge on the no side but if we are flipping that if you're if you're not you know you're not going through menopause uh, but would you be comfortable and I think this maybe applies to more people in the room people talking to you like your your your, your staff coming to talk to you about what they are going through so would you be able to conduct a conversation would be comfortable to talk about it so um, let's see what everyone thinks about that. And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just getting your opinions. OK, again, flipped probably what I would think. And Lee's nodding with me because I'm going to kind of going to come to you next to talk about how we get comfortable with the uncomfortable how you know because this is difficult for for a guy like you and I met at a breakfast and I made a beeline for you because yeah. sort of stood out funnily <laughs> enough um, at a menopause breakfast yeah. so I zoomed over to you to say what are you doing here yeah and I think that from my perspective obviously a big part of men starting to get comfortable with the conversation is the acceptance that it directly impacts 51 percent of the population but it indirectly impacts everybody and whether that's in the workplace, whether that's at home, whether that's with family, friends, colleagues, there's always someone within your circle who is probably going through significant challenges with the symptoms at this moment in time. And obviously for men, they don't have a representative aspect, but men do have hormones as well. And I think that so often for men, it's actually starting to become a little bit more conscious of what people are going, you know, are going through around them. Uh, an opportunity to learn and educate themselves and not always expect women to be the ones educating them to really stop looking at it as this woman's issue it kind of intersects with a lot of other challenges quite often around women you know suffering ageism and the invisibility that it intersects with usually at the age around perimenopause so from that male perspective there's, there's numerous reasons whether, they want, whether you want to become a better leader a better husband whether you want to actually start to think about how you can support the people around you. It's all part of that wider agenda about starting to become more self-aware of the things that other people might be going through. And even though men don't have a direct context, there is a lot of considerations that they need to start to think about, especially given you know women in the workplace are incredibly talented, 
highly competent and quite often businesses are losing them because of a lack of support and from the many women that I've spoken to over the years they don't want massive systemic change, they don't want spotlighting, what they want is a little bit of support, a little bit of compassion and a few minor things adjusting to make their working and everyday lives better and men can play a significant part in that. And can I, can I just say, I, I think it's really important as well to remember that women now with life expectancy spend more of their life menopausal than they do reproductively. Yeah, correct. And the, the support for women in the workplace about, around being reproductive is brilliant in most organisations and actually for men as well. But, but the sort of, you know, post that, it just, you know, in most places drops off a cliff. Totally. And, we, and we've, you know, we, we look at, um, you know, in, in lots of my younger career, you know, um, the whole thing around returning after maternity and, and making sure we support people. But I suppose for that, you know, um, there's a lot of talk around uh, what policies maybe should look like. I mean, do you have a policy at um, Aviva? Um, we'd, we'd, we have policies to support people for, you know, who, who need leave. I think, I think what we have in Aviva that's, that's most important, actually, is, is back to, you know, what we talked about at the beginning. So we offer support through an app called Pepe, um, which gives, um, uh, you know, kind of online support, but also one-to-one -one counselling, because I think, you know, the, the health service really struggles to support in this space. Um, and certainly, you know, my, my advice to you know, girlfriends when they come to me and say, I've been to my GP and I haven't had much support is, OK, you need to go back and get really cross because that's, that's right, you know, yeah. that's not OK. Tell them your hormones are, you know, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, so I think I think the, the sort of education support is really important. And actually, one of the things we did with Pepe is that we extended the service to partners so that actually it's not just the individual, oh. but as, as a partner, yeah. you can understand what um, uh, your, your female partner's going through. Um, and then I think it's just talking about it to get rid of the stigma. So we have a menopause discussion group at work and I attended and shared my story. I mean, I have to say, I sometimes feel like a bit of a fraud. I have been one of the women who is reasonably lucky, um, but I appreciate that lots of people aren't. And it's my responsibility to be an ally for people who've, who have a really tough time with it. I do have a tough time. Saskia, um, you know, you and I, have, have, you know, I've met quite a few times and, and we're both quite uh, big advocates of uh, HRT, um, you know, because it's, it, it is, quite frankly, if you get it right, it's uh, wonderful. I feel 35 now, despite not looking it. Um, but, you know, th there's also, like, I suppose, the holistic view, you know, it's not a magic bullet. You know, mm. what do you think, you know, women in, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we power through and make sure we can still perform in midlife? I think it's really important that we recognise that every single woman's menopause is different and there is no one solution and also that we mustn't be finger waggy about HRT or mm -hmm. never drink again. You know, every woman will have her own approach to it. What's really key and we've, you know, we've all touched on it is education so that women know exactly what's going on at this time of life, exactly how they can look after themselves a bit better. I mean, it is true, wine is not your friend once you hit perimenopause, sadly. Um, it's still my friend. It's still, still, my friend. still one of my close it's friends. It's not my friend. <laughs> my best mate. It's not my friend at 3 a.m. when I wake up with hot <laughs> legs <laughs> and alkanoia. Um, but it, it's about finding a solution that works for you, but also taking responsibility. And, you know, we say this a lot to the women in our community know what you are wanting before you go to your GP because your GP may not be great on this topic. So go having educated yourself, understand what all the symptoms are, understand what all the possible solutions are. Yes, HRT is one option. It will have to be prized out of my hands. I am never coming off it. Ditto. But not every woman Ditto. can and also not every woman chooses to. So I think it's understanding that health and well-being holistically are really, really important. Because it's nutrition, isn't it? And it's sleep. Nutrition and is it's key. Sleep, and that will help with sleep. Exercise is key. You know, this is... But it's almost an opportunity, I think, when you come into the perimenopause years to really do a little bit of an MOT on your lifestyle and your health and your, you know, you've maybe been thinking about exercise for a long time. Now is the time to start. So I think we have to take responsibility as women going through this. Um, 
it's not just about expecting everyone else to support us. And it can last a long time, right? I mean, mine has lasted like 10 years. So. All the symptoms, I mean, I don't know if everyone, like the definitions are, you know, menopause is just one moment in time. It's just 12 months since your last period. So you are perimenopausal, the storm before the calm, from average age is 45 in the UK, average age of that menopause moment is 51. And then for some women, the symptoms carry on into their 60s and 70s. Yes, exactly, which is why you can you can stay on it for stay on forever. HRT forever. Um, yep. we're, we're getting it. I'm definitely. I'm, we can, we've got a couple of um, questions that are coming in actually um, from our audience. So really, thank you for that. Um, and I don't know who. I mean, I, I kind of feel, Danny, this is going to automatically come to you. But um, the biggest things that organisations can do. So we talked a bit about support, but yep. I think it is support, but also probably training, right? Yeah, I think. Um, for leaders, I think they just need awareness. I mean, I would expect leaders on challenges for their employees, whether it's mental health, which can actually come with, with the menopause, or you know, physical health issues, or ju just the menopause, or brain fog, or it's too hot in here for me. You know, can I have a fan at my desk? Um, I would expect them, in, you know, I think organisations need to equip leaders to kind of triage because what you don't want is a leader thinking, I'm a mental health advisor, mm. I'm, a, I'm a menopause advisor. So there's something about having the infrastructure and the support available and making sure that leaders know where to point people, but that they go, thank you for telling me. I, you know, I want to help you. Um, you know, how would you feel if a colleague came to you and said, I'm diabetic and therefore I need to have breaks in meetings, I need to keep an eye on my blood sugar, I need to drink plenty of fluid, I need to look after myself you'd go, absolutely, I can support you. A woman comes to you and says, I'm menopausal. And, you know, it's like, <gasps> I think for lots of people, it's scary. But it's, it's like many things. As leaders, you have to remember, it's much worse for the person who's telling you. Mm -hmm. We have given you people to look after. That comes with responsibility. Please use it wisely and be kind and supportive. And just listen, actually. And then go away and see what you can do to help. It's so, the listen, isn't yeah. it? Because yep. I think, you know, women in, in perimenopause, um, I know I had um, crippling um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said in the, in the film, I, th I, thought I, had, um, I thought I had early onset dementia. So obviously it does affect people's, my, my symptoms definitely were mostly mental health symptoms actually, mm -hmm. rather than yeah. anything physical. So it's like, like to your point, it's not necessarily something you can see, is it? No. Um, another question that we've got from your audience, um, so to be able to talk about menopause, we have to get comfortable talking about ageing. I mean, that's a great one, so thank you for that. So what can companies do to tackle ageism in the workforce? So Lee, um, have you got any nuggets and like anyone can jump in on this one? Yeah, so I definitely think it's kind of looking at where, from a company's perspective, wellbeing and inclusion intersect. There's potential there to look at the considerations around the fact that, you know, within organisations there are you know, age is challenges and it's not often looked at in the wider diversity, inclusion and equity agendas. Um, naturally, a wellbeing strategy, given that, you know, the menopause itself is guaranteed for a significant portion of the workforce to be impacted directly, it needs to be part of that wider strategy. But, you know, like Danny just alluded to, there also needs to be the space created for people to be listened to, for, you know, re some removal of some of that judgment and as well to destigmatize it, it needs to become normalized in conversation. There needs to be more around it, both from a communication perspective, also the potential for training and support, but also from that, you know, that leadership perspective of, of modeling. And you know, what I've found with the organizations that I've worked with is that case studies are really powerful when someone is willing to share their journey. It's very, very powerful for engaging men if there's a male case study who shares how they potentially supported their partner or a colleague and it really ignites curiosity in other men but you know that the wider piece around ageism in the workplace we do need to look at that it presents a whole set of challenges and workplaces are losing the most experienced the most capable and often the most skilled people because they've not really put anything in place to look at the ages challenges that their employees might be facing yeah and i mean the whole be educated for kind of 16 to 20 years, work for 40 years, and then retire for 20 years, isn't going to work. <laughs> go go, on a, cruise, go on a cruise. That is, that is not, that is not yeah. going to work. So 
you know, and there's this massive talent pool of really experienced people, as you yeah. say. I mean, I think um, certainly at Aviva, and I can take no credit for this because it was it was set up when I joined, our inclusion communities, we actually have one called Generations, which looks at age across across the organisation. I would really encourage, you know, other businesses to do the same, to not just think about inclusion in terms of gender, sexuality. That mm. actually, there, there are, so we have a carers community um, um, and we have Generations. I, I would really encourage organisations to do that because this sort of, you know, the stigma of the age along with it just being females is, is just not helpful. Just one more thing, though, on the ageism piece. Can we educate every single photo editor at national newspapers that mm. when they run a menopause story, not to run a picture of an exhausted woman? There was Crying on a bench, was I that mean, the one look it up, saw, right? Yeah. <laughs> there was one this week in, I won't name names, but it begins with G and ends in Guardian. <laughs> and it was a story on menopausal women, and it was a picture of a woman weeping on a park bench. I mean... That was me. Who has <laughs> so I think there is an ageist attitude towards menopause that it is, you know, you are past your sell by date, you are, you know, done with life. It's simply not true. It's J Lo at the Super Bowl, for heaven's sake. You know, that's yes. a menopausal age yes. woman. So get with the program. Fifty two and just, smashing it. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so so right. And and uh, ageism is ageism actually is um I really, so whoever put that question on that was a, that was a great question because we, we, we probably don't talk about that um, as much as we should and it, and it does sit in the same bracket because I think lots of women have come to me and said to me over the years, I don't want to talk about my menopause to my boss because then I'm saying I'm old, I'm old and yeah. therefore then I might, get, I might lose my job and no matter how much you reassure people to say actually you should really own it. Like you should... Also, sorry, I could bang on about this one for a while but I think it's why our generation has such a responsibility to the next generation of women coming through that we reinvent how this stage of life is viewed so that they're not coming towards it thinking, oh, God, you know, ageism and all of that will hit me at that point. We have to change the dialogue. Yeah. Um, we're getting lots of more questions as well from the audience, which is great. Any suggestions on how to bring up the menopause discussion with a boss? Anybody want to take that one from me? Do you, want, do you want me to have a go? Go you're, on. You're, um, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 t I tend to be advising the leaders, but actually, um, I think, you know, if you go to somebody and say, I need your help, that is your start point. Uh, there are very few humans in this world who will not go, of course, how can I help you? And then you have the conversation. Just, I need your help. Mm -hmm. Because what you're going to say, actually, while it might be a real issue for you, is because you say that to your boss, they're like, uh-oh, incoming. Mm. Oh, okay, well, we can, you know, I can help you with this. So I would just start with, I, I need your help. Yeah. It's the best way to start that. It does quite often put bosses into a support mindset. So they then start to think about, you know, potential ways that they could support you before you've even broached the topic. And it just, again, gives an opportunity for you to, you know, showcase a little bit of vulnerability at that point and again like Danny says very few humans are going to repel you at that point I think it's the whole comfortable thing as well the uncomfortable we're talking about is is for you know some training for leaders I suppose at you know having them conversations it's very tricky I think as well and and I don't know what anyone and this is particularly really probably for you two ladies if if somebody when you were going through your perimenopause and maybe before you maybe identified with it if somebody had said to you um, oh, you know, you're a bit angry. I was very angry. Like, are you going through perimenopause? Would you, I mean, I, I potentially might have hit somebody in the face. I think I would have, I would have. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 you know, maybe we're sometimes a part of the problem but, as well. Well, I think that's, that's a key point because I had terrible anxiety and I had no idea that it was perimenopause, despite the fact that I'd worked in women's publishing for 25 years. So actually, if I had had a boss who was educated in it and knew what was going on and recognised that me as a 49-year-old woman suddenly losing confidence and sobbing in the loo more times than, you know, is, is healthy, I would have actually loved it if they'd recognised that and been able to yeah. start that conversation. It would have saved me two years of thinking that I was terrible at my job. It, it is a really, I mean, I might punch someone as well. Same. I didn't have the anger, I had the weeping and the daily 
feelings of doom. But it's it's that you know that that thing of hormones and and the female that if someone had asked you twenty years ago if you were premenstrual, you probably mm. would have thought that was pretty invasive, right, and inappropriate as a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think certainly uh, what I would have been comfortable with is, um, are you okay? You don't seem yourself. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is a really easy way to open that conversation, yeah. is it? Rather than actually, you know, worry that you're yeah. upsetting somebody by, yeah. you yeah. know, and it's a shame that also that women still think that maybe being labelled as perimenopausal is not a good thing. Yeah. It's a real challenge because you get different perspectives on, on being willing to disclose to certain people based on prior interactions. Uh, and again, we need to normalise it so it's easier to disclose but at the same time appreciating that you know for, for some women they've not they've had a they've been invalidated in the medical system they've been invalidated at work they spent you know potentially a lot of the careers climbing a lot of barriers and obstacles and quite often you know the women that i meet they've also got caring responsibilities upwards and downwards and they're managing so many different aspects and really they don't want to be judged at that point they're already doing so much it just comes down to, you know, like Danny said, instead of instead of men sometimes going, oh, is it menopausal? <laughs> it's just a simple reality where actually you brought it with a bit of curiosity, a little bit of consideration to notice and sometimes be the one who can spot the early signals of someone who you work with on a regular basis, just changing slightly. Mm. And then just asking that question with curiosity, creating the space to listen and not jump into assumptions and judgments because that can be as damaging as some of the symptoms itself. And I suppose from a, you know if you're in a relationship um, you know it's the same there isn't it sometimes those you're closest to and particularly if you're suffering from rage I think like what I did um, my poor husband <laughs> went through a reasonable amount but um, it's encouraging them to ask the right questions as well isn't it about what's maybe wrong you know we know that the biggest demographic of um, divorce, actually, mm. is for women going through perimenopause, instigated, I suppose, by sometimes women going through perimenopause. Well, we will never beat the taboo unless men feel comfortable being in on the conversation as well. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it has to be everyone talking about this. Totally. And um, one of the um, last questions we've got from, um, from the audience um, is kind of talking about that, about having the broader conversation, but also bringing in, you know, periods and fertility and menopause in, in, in one thing. And, I, you know, because I suppose that because we, we certainly, like you said, you know, somebody, certainly when I worked in a trading floor when I was in my 20s and 30s, you know, that would have been bandished around a bit if there was a bit of an angry woman. Somebody, some trader might have said, another trader, male trader might have said, you know, she's on a period or, 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 or words to that effect. I won't actually <laughs> repeat what would that have been said. That's what? the polite version. Um, you know, that, that's, that's not okay. It's not okay to, to, to say it. So how, how, do we, how do we, I suppose, get rid of that stigma? Do we, we just need to talk more? I think we need to talk more. I think also we just need to acknowledge that some women will be incredibly private about all of this. So there are some women Don't listening to, to this going... It. Cringe. I can imagine nothing worse than, you know, somebody... Every woman's asking. different. Yes, Every woman's exactly, which is so, different. are you okay? You know, you don't see... How can I support you? Um, and but, but know that the resource, the support is there and there is no taboo. It's, it's a, a conversation you can have and you can ask for help. So I think, just, just, to, just to wrap up, um, thank you for so much interaction from the audience. Is there maybe one takeaway that we can give to our our audience and, and our people watching on live today from maybe if I start at you, Lee, just one little nugget you want to give everyone to take away. Yeah, so it's about that kind of curious support, creating a space to listen and attaching it to well-being and inclusion because it's important to be able to embed it within the workplace, normalise those conversations. Saskia? Educate yourself, understand what's going on with your health and then take the breaks off midlife because it is a brilliant time of life. Don't let me. And don't drink wine, you said. Maybe don't drink wine. <laughs> as don't, don't listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Danny. <laughs> um, everything they said, um, so I'm going to add one on, which is um, be, if, if you are impacted by perimenopause, menopause, go and insist on the support that you need. Go and insist. Do not tolerate, well, you seem fine, take a herbal remedy. 
if HRT is for you, if you can take it, insist you deserve and need the support. Do not be fobbed off.